Okay, today we're happy to have uh, Jack Collins from Slack, who's going to tell us about representation learning of collider events. Thank you for having me here virtually at uh, UC Davis. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about some um, machine learning stuff I've been exploring for the past several months. So, uh, you all know what an LHC event looks like. Um, there's lots of particles, and um, one convenient way of representation, re representing all of the uh, data contained in a collider event is just a list of the three vectors of all the particles in the event. Um, so in a multi jet event like this, there might be hundreds of particles. Um, and so there's hundreds of numbers that you know, specify um, what an event is. Um, and the event uh, is um, invariant under you know, permutations of uh, the labels that you give the particles. And so this, these permutation invariant lists are um, called point clouds outside of particle physics. Um, so that's the, you know, it's at some level, like fundamentally the data we work with in, in collider physics. Um, uh, but so this, uh, naively, this is like a very high dimensional data set. There's hundreds of numbers in that data set. Um, uh, but we know, uh, uh, you know, it's not, the particles aren't some random draw from a 500 dimensional uniform distribution. Uh, there's lots of structure in, um, in collider events that means that you know, much of this information is redundant for understanding the important physics. We know, for instance, that you know, particles are highly collimated into jets, and oftentimes we only want to know about the bulk properties of the jets and not the detailed substructure. So we could maybe um, cut this down to just the three momenta of a few jets. Um, or even cut it down further to say maybe this is if we're interested in an RPV um, uh, Suzy Gluino search, for instance, maybe we only want to know some jet PTs and the overall HT of the event. Um, uh, so um, you know, the, the the question that I'm I, I, I has been at the forefront of my mind in, in pursuing this this project I'll be talking about is how much information is there really in a jet. Um, uh, you know, the, the, um, this data is drawn, this, uh, uh, the data is embedded in this very high dimensional space, but it's drawn from a much simpler, um, uh, lower dimensional manifold. Now, of course, this question is, is broad and vague. It doesn't have a concrete answer. In fact, it's not even conc concretely specified yet. Um, like if you're, if you're interested in some particular search, you might only be interested in, uh, some, small number of observables and maybe someone in doing a different search is interested in a different set of observables. Um, uh, and I, um, so I've been interested in how to probe this question in a way that um, is broader than um, uh, you know, the, uh, having a specific search in mind and asking how many variables we need for that. I don't, I, 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 coming from the perspective of you know, starting with a data set and trying to probe the data set, um, uh, how much information is there in that data set? Whereas um, in the past, uh, well, also continuing, uh, uh, you know, the main way we approach this in physics is we start by understanding the theoretical, uh, the, the, the physical theory and, and use that to inform um, what information we expect to be relevant in the data set. Uh, but I want to probe this from the other direction, seeing if there's ways uh, uh, without, pod, without starting with too much theoretical input, how can we extract from the data set how much information is in it? And so, uh, you know, as I said, this is a very broad question and I'm not going to have any complete, you know, broad answer to it. Um, I, I, um, but I'm going to follow some particular narrow path, um, uh, which is this topic of representation learning and um, variational autoencoders. Uh, that um, uh, yeah, once you keep at the back of your mind throughout this talk, that this is the question I'm trying to probe with um, with what I'm doing. Okay, so um, I've got a feast prepared for you, and here's the menu. So we've just had the aperitif. Um, uh, the introductory discussion of um, how much information is in a jet. Um, and then I'm going to um, present you um, an appetizer, which is an introduction to this 
kind of machine learning architecture called an autoencoder. Um, uh, what, one thing that you'll learn throughout my talk is that I'm, I'm not a very good cook. Um, so the, the autoencoder ultimately is not going to be very, very useful for the tasks that I, for the questions I'm trying to probe. And, um, the point of introducing the autoencoder as an appetizer is, is to, sh to highlight by contrast how nice the variational autoencoder in the main course will be. So I don't think it's a good culinary strategy to present a poor appetizer in order to highlight the main course, but I think it's a sound uh, pedagogical strategy. And then we're going to take a detour because we're going to need physics input, of course, and that's what the FISH course is, the metric space of collider events, where I'll talk about previous work from the MIT group, uh, Jesse Thaler and his students, um, which is going to be at the heart of a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. And then I'll present the main course, uh, which I described uh, uh, introducing this variational autoencoder, which is the main tool that I'm going to be using to probe these questions of, of what kind of structures are there and in the data set. Um, and then I'll follow up. The cheese selection will be a concrete application of this to the top jets. This is still very much preliminary um, work in progress, um, uh, which is why, you know, the, the, well, yeah, so the, the focus of the talk is going to be the pedagogy of, um, of, you know, how can we use variational order encoders to extract information. And the, this is just going to be a, phys uh, a physics um, illustration. Uh, but the focus of the talk is more on, uh, you know, the general question of, of, of um, what I'm trying to do with the variational autoencoders on data sets in general. And then the desserts are mystery special. Um, you'll see it when we get there. And then finally, uh, the digestive is the conclusions. Um, and, you know, if, 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 if you want to... Um, who goes off at some parts of the talk, that's fine. I just want to emphasize that the point where, you, where I really want you to pay most attention is during the main course. Um, and the rest of the, the talk is mainly there to provide context to what I'm talking about in the main course. Okay, so the autoencoder. Um, so the autoencoder is, uh, is, uh, uh, is a kind of neural network architecture purpose in life is given an input like this picture of an apple. Its job is to output um, a picture of an apple that's as close to the input as possible. So it's a trivial thing, it's just the identity map. Um, but what makes the autoencoder um, interesting is that it's actually, you know, oftentimes with neural networks, we try and make them as powerful as possible. Uh, the autoencoder is, is purposefully hobbled by, um, in the middle it has um, a narrow layer with a small number of nodes. That means it can only transmit a small amount of information to, to this middle layer. Um, so there may only be, uh, here there's only three numbers being transmitted um, in, this, in this illustration. Uh, so somehow, um, so this first part of the neural network is called the encoder. And the encoder is going to take this image, which is maybe 100 pixels by 100 pixels, so 10,000 numbers, is going to compress it to three numbers. And then this, uh, this last part of the neural network called the decoder is going to take those three numbers and try and reproduce the apple. And so, um, uh, in the, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide and then come back to this slide actually. So, you know, the reason that there's, in, there's lots of reasons that there's lots of practical applications for this, but what's interesting to me is that um, somehow this, this middle layer is somehow uh, representing this high dimensional apple and, and some small, small number of features that's supposed to capture the essence of this particular apple that the decoder can then use to reproduce the apple as, as best it can. And so, yeah, this is a, this is exact, well, yeah, this is exactly one of the things that we try and do in physics. We try and, um, um, you know, reduce a complex high dimensional problem to, you know, the, the, the fund a small number of fundamental, um, uh, elements. Um, and so, you know, maybe, maybe we can learn something about apples by studying the, um, what's the, this is called the latent space or the latent code um, of an autoencoder trained on, on apples. Um, so of course, in order to train this neural network, I said the, the output is supposed to be close to the input. You need some way to quantify what close means. So with images, normally the, the standard measure for closeness is um, you take 
you know, the top left pixel of the input, subtract the intensity on the top left pixel on the output, um, and take the absolute value squared. And then you sum that or average it over all the pixels. And so if all the pixels are identical between the two pictures, they're, um, they're the same picture. Um, and um, yeah, um, and practically that uh, happens to be effective for, for photos, but it, it doesn't it doesn't have much meaning. And if, if I really want to interpret meaning from the middle, physic, physics meaning, I, I, I need to start from some, some uh, I need to have some, uh, I need to have a distance measure that encodes something physically meaningful. I, I want to point out that this is, you know, this is, uh, I, I brought up in the, um, in the DJST for uh, uh, a notion of, of, of geometry, right? That the data set of a collider event, it's, there's some, uh, it's embedded in some high, very high dimensional space, hundreds of dimensions, but the real data manifold is some smaller, um, smaller um, manifold within that space. And the structure of that manifold is, is determined by, by um, the laws of physics that we know and love. Um, so and geometry requires some notion of, of distance. Um, and so there's a connection here between, you know, differences between input and output of an autoencoder and, and distances between objects, which are a requirement for a geometric understanding. And so, um, so the question that I want to probe next is what is an appropriate distance measure for two jets? If I have one jet, I have another jet. I could say qualitatively are these two jets or these two collider events. It doesn't really matter if they look similar or they look different. Uh, but I need, a, um, I need a quantitative measure for that. And there's not going to be a single quantitative measure, but um, there's, uh, you know, there should be uh, classes of precise uh, uh, quantitative measures that uh, uh, are of um, varying um, physical relevance. Okay, so that takes us to the fish costs. Um, and the, uh, the next few slides I'm, I, I've literally just taken from some slides that Jesse Thaler gave at Slack a year ago because, uh, uh, um, yeah, this is uh, the work of, of their group, Jesse, Patrick, and Eric. And, you know, I, I don't think I can actually present it better than, than Jesse did in these slides. Um, okay. So that proposal, so that paper wasn't anything about machine learning. That paper was just, um, uh, to define a geometric distance measure between jets or between collider events and try and understand um, uh, try and understand the geometry that results from that geometric distance measure um, uh, try and understand how that geometry is related to physics um, and so it's a, you know it's a different perspective than that we're used to probing physics but perhaps it um could lead to either new insights or new ways of looking at into old insights. Um, so, okay, uh, in this image, there's three different jets, a so one-prong jet, a two-prong jet, and a three-prong jet. And each, each circle in each of these images is a particle, and the size of the circle, I guess the area is proportional to the um, PT of that particle. Um, and so the question is, given, say, the red and the blue jet, or the red and the green jet, what is the distance uh, between them and how does it compare to the distance between say the red jet and the blue jet um, uh, as the red jet and the blue jet further apart or closer together compared to the red and the green jet and the distance measure they propose is uh, defined here um, so this time here i'm going to ignore for my purposes so this um, this accounts for the fact if two jets have different energies how do you account for that everything i'm going to do i'm going to I'm only going to compare jets of the same energy um, just for simplicity. So we're going to focus on this term, which is the interesting one. So the idea is this distance measure is defined as um, uh, uh, um, it's the cost of, tr of transforming one jet into another jet, where the cost is defined as um, uh, the, the energy of the particle being moved times by the distance it has to be moved. Uh, this is a concept that existed long before uh, the MIT group introduced it in particle physics. And the name comes from the idea, um, instead of particles and PTs, you can imagine um, literally piles of earth um, uh, in a field like the one behind me. Um, and you know, you have a shovel and 
there's the earth is arranged in three piles of varying heights and you want to rearrange them for whatever reason into four piles of different heights and different positions. And you want, so you want to move the dirt from the original configuration to the final configuration, putting in as the minimal effort uh, that's possible. And so first of all, you need what's called a transport plan. Uh, well, actually, first of all, you need to know what are the distances between the piles in the original configuration and the piles in the final configuration, um, which in the case of particles, um, is this theta ij, which is literally the delta r between. So the i corresponds to the, um, the is the index corresponding to particles in the first jet, and the j um, corresponds to the particles in the second jet. So theta 1, 3 is the delta r between particle 1 of the first jet and particle 3 of the second jet. Um, and so this is just a, a matrix. And um, once I have those distances, I can then figure out a transport plan which is um, I'm going to move this much dirt from this pile on the original configuration to this pile in the final configuration. And that defines a matrix of uh, uh, for each, each original pile, I have a number for how much of that dirt I'm transferring to each of the final piles. And so there's a matrix, which is the FIJ, which is my, the transport plan. And any particular transport plan, there's some cost associated with it, which is the trace of the product of these matrices, the sum. And then if you minimize overall plants, um, then you find the optimal transport plan, the one that requires minimal work. And then the, the result of this trace is the earth move resistance. Um, uh, and that's the, that defines a distance between um, two jets or two collider events, it doesn't matter. And then these are just various constraints that there is a, you know, energy is conserved. Um, uh, these are constraint equations. Um, uh, and this literally defines a metric space um, in which jets or collider events form a, a, an actual geometric manifold. It satisfies, I think critically that there's a triangle inequality that's satisfied. Um, uh, I think that's the only non-trivial thing. Um, and so one can literally think of, you know, if, if each, each jet is a point in a, in a, in a space, then the collection of all jets forms some real geometric manifold um, with the distance between jets defined by this quantity. Okay. Um, and what's in, well, I, um, this distance measure, you know, uh, it corresponds to, to real, um, uh, real physics um, in the sense that. Um, there's a hierarchy of the hierarchy of distances between jets corresponds to hierarchies and energy scales um, uh, associated with the physics of, of jet evolution. So, um, uh, so here's, here's a top quark which um, decays to, to three quarks in each of those shower and hadronize. And uh, maybe the top quark is boosted, it starts with a momentum of around 500 GV. I'm going to play this movie again if I can. I need to turn off my laser pointer. There you go. So yeah, first of all, you have just the pure top and then it decays into three particles and then they um, shower and then they hadronize. And um, the video is showing the optimal transport plan from, from one stage to the next, to the, the evolution of this jet. And you see the distances, the earth movers distance between the original top quark and its daughters is comparable to the top mass. So that sets the scale. Uh, so um, yeah, that's uh, different. Um, different top quark decays will also have distances between them um, comparable to to their mass scale, and then the uh, uh, the showering adds another distance at fifty GeV, and then hydronization at thirty GeV. Um, now geometric manifolds have um, a notion of dimensionality. Um, oftentimes in mathematics, people only talk about intrinsic dimensionality, but in physics, we know that, you know, dimensionality is, um, a resolution dependent, um, uh, quantity. It depends on how, how, what resolution you want to, you want to um, trip the thing you're looking at. Um, so here's some definition of, of. There's many definitions of dimensionality you can define on a data set, and here's one which is intuitive. Um, before, before I go to the equation, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on um, 
Oh, you can't see. I need to put laser pointer on again. There you go. Okay. Um, so here's some data set. Each point here is some data point in a two in a embedded in a two dimensional space. And the dimensionality of this data set is dependent on the resolution at which you probe it. If you're an ant that's um, kind of of the size of this little circle here, um, uh, you're living in a two dimensional space. Um, whereas if you're a big ant, um, uh, then this, look, this whole thing looks like a line um, and you're not resolving the width of the line. And then as you zoom up further, you know, if this line curves around, then maybe it starts looking two dimensional again. Eventually, as you zoom out to infinity, uh, this whole, all, all of this data collapses to a point and it becomes zero dimensional. Okay, um, and how can one quantify that? Well, suppose you take a box or a sphere um, in, in some neighborhood of this data set and you ask, uh, how does the number of points within that box vary according to the radius of the box? You know uh, uh, that, that the number of points in the box goes like r to the dimensionality. In a sphere, it's r cubed. In a circle, it's r squared. And all this formula does, the log and the derivative, um, it brings down this dimensionality. Um, uh, 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 and gives this dimensionality here as the result of this, this equation. Um, so one can do that on, you know, you can simulate a bunch of different kinds of jets, um, at various levels in the simulation process, and you know, plot what's the dimensionality of these jets as a function of um, the energy scale, which um, in the previous picture corresponds to the size of the, the spheres that you're investigating. And so take top jets, for instance. Um, if you probe them at um, you know, a scale comparable to their mass, 100 GeV, you get a dimensionality of five or six, which literally is a counting of the number of um, angles that you need to specify the configuration of the three um, quarks of the top decay. After, so there's, um, you know, so there's nine, if you have an arbitrary three particle configuration, there's nine numbers that define that. Uh, but, um, they first of all centered the jets so they're only interested in um, relative angles so that takes away um, uh, two degrees of freedom so you're down to um, seven um, they're only lo looking at a narrow pt band so that eliminates um, most of a another dimension and also tops they have um, uh, they're not uh, they have a mass and so the the um, uh, there's a, a mass constraint, although there's some width to that. Um, so that removes potentially up to another dimension. And so you get something between uh, five or six for the dimensionality. Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first question is, uh, uh, let's say you see the <clears throat> multi-body phase space. How many particles actually in one jet? Just a rough idea. I want to get a rough idea. So. Um, in a fully showered and hydrogenized top jet of this momentum, you have anywhere. So I, I think it peaks around the distribution peaks around um, forty particles, but it can get to um, uh, it can get to one or two hundred particles. Two hundred the particle. Uh, at at most, but typically it's forty or fifty in a top jet. Actually, okay. doesn't depend. On. Okay, another question in this plot. So you say the R is one point zero. Then what's the the jet algorithm you're using, NTKT? Uh, so uh, this, this isn't my plot, it's Jesse, Patrick, and Eric's, but um, I'm pretty sure, sh um, I suspect they're using Cambridge Akron to, to cluster these jets. I should okay. point out, so that the dotted curves are uh, literally the three part on decay. Um, uh, and then the dashed is after showering, but without hydronization. And then solid is after hydronization. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, they might be using anti KT, I'm, I'm not really sure. And I, I don't think it really matters for this plot. Okay, okay. Thank you. Now, uh, yeah, okay. And you see for W, you know, at around the W mass, you have a dimensionality of, a, of around a couple, um, uh, which is the, um, 
you know, the angle of the two trunks and the relative, um, the relative energy sharing. And then QCD jets, they don't have any, any peak. And all of them, as you go to low and lower energies, you get this um, scaling of dimensionality as you go to low and lower, lower you probe at smaller and smaller scales, uh, um, uh, small and smaller energy scales, um, which is coming from the um, you know, uh, QCD emissions, which adds additional complexity to the uh, to the jets, um, and there's no specific scale associated with that, which is why there's no, you know, peak there. It's just the um, uh, the scaling, um, and you know, just to show that there's something quantitative uh, in this. Um, so they, um, I'm not sure if this calculation has been published yet, but it's been in their uh, slides. Um, you know, they took quark and gluon jets and they wanted to see if they could actually calculate this dimensionality scaling. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the details of this calculation, but they showed that you can do a perturbative QCD calculation. Ultimately, it's actually just calculating you know, the number of, of, of emissions from the jet um, as a function of scale. And um, uh, this leading log calculation matches their observations um, at the higher energy scales, um, they start to diverge at lower energy scales where you'd need um, uh, higher order corrections. Um, and so these dimensionalities really correspond to um, you know, physical, physical quantities. Um, so it's, 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 it's not yet clear whether you know, this geometric picture of jets and collider events is going to lead to new insights, but uh, it seems like an interesting new way of, of probing collider data, and I think it's worth um, uh, exploring. Um, so as I said, everything that they did, it has, there's no machine learning in it, it's just literally calculating things on, on jets, uh, but calculating geometric quantities on jets. And there's actually a new paper, I, I don't know if it's out yet, I got a pre-archive uh, pre version where they, they showed that a lot of quantities, a lot of jet quantities that have been discovered um, over the past couple of decades can be actually, can be actually thought of as um, uh, encoded in some way within um, Earth movers distance and related quantities. Um, but I don't have anything in detail to say about that. Okay, so now for the main course. Although actually, the, I left a bit of the appetizer on the table, which uh, so I'll have to finish that off uh, uh, with the autoencoder, the regular autoencoder. And um, uh, so we have a distance measure that we can now use as a reconstruction error to train an autoencoder. Um, and then the question is, does the, um, if we train such an autoencoder, does the latent space learn interesting physics or not? And the answer is going to be not. And I'll, I'll show you why very clearly with this simple, easy to visualize toy example. So on the left, I've generated uh, some data set. Uh, it's a two-dimensional space. Each, each event is just um, one of these dots. It's a pair of coordinates in the x and y directions. And this blue point is, is one of these, these events. And then I'm going to train my autoencoder on these events. Um, and then it outputs, again, these uh, two-dimensional uh, coordinates. And the um, reconstruction error um, it's just the Euclidean distance, the standard Euclidean distance between the output point and the input point. Um, so what does the, so, and I, I have uh, only one node in the latent space. It's trying to compress two numbers into one number. Um, so here's what it's learned. So uh, in the middle plot, that's just a histogram of, given all this data, all these real data points on the left, what's the histogram of encode of, of the latent space. This is the histogram in some arbitrary shape. And then I can remap these latent codes to the real space uh, by, as, as I go along this histogram, I take equally spaced points along this histogram and I decode them uh, to get this line in this two dimensional space. Um, and so, what the autoencoder is doing, given a point on the input space, is going to map it to the closest point on this line. Um, and so it's encoding it just something like the distance along this line. Um, so that's not useful. So what it's learning is just some dense packing 
of the data space. Uh, and it's going to be highly coupled with how powerful, how expressive is the network architecture. You know, in the limit that the architectures, yeah, you know, I use a very simple neural network. It's, got, it's going to want to pack this as densely as possible with some complicated line shape. And it can do that better and better, you know, the, the more powerful I make my neural network. And yes, you know, so that's not really telling me much about the structure of the data set. This isn't going to tell me much about physics. It's just going to tell me about, about um, how clever I am at making um, neural networks. So this is no good. Um, but the variational order encoder um, is qualitatively very different. Um, so in a, in a variational order encoder, um, so in the regular order encoder, you're encoding deterministically to a, to a latent space. In the variational order encoder, you're encoding probabilistically to the latent space. In particular, you encode deterministically to a set of um, means and variances. So if I have a two-dimensional latent space, I encode the two means and two variances. And then um, my latent code is a single sample from the, uh, the two-dimensional Gaussian distribution determined by those four numbers, or the n-dimensional Gaussian determined by those two n numbers. Um, and then that code is then decoded into, into um, an output. And the last function, in addition to the reconstruction error that we had before, it also has this extra term, uh, which is called the KL divergence between the encoded distribution and a multivariate Gaussian. Uh, what it is, is uh, intuitively, it's the cost for encoding information. And the reason, I'm going to go into great detail about this in the next couple of slides, because I think it's important to understand. But uh, first off, to understand why I'm calling this an information cost. Um, so this term here is minimized um, for all mu's being zero and all sigmas being one for every um, latent space direction, which means that every single input is going to be mapped to the same standard Gaussian distribution. And so the latent space contains, if this term is minimized, the latent space contains no information about the input. Every input is encoded to the same distribution. And so the decoder learns nothing about the encoder. Um, whereas, of course, the reconstruction error, in order to reconstruct the input well, the reconstruction error requires that information about the input is, is um, passed through from the encoder to the decoder. And so there's a competition between these two terms. This wants information to be transferred. This doesn't want information to be transferred. Um, and then there's this beta here, which is a relative weight. It's a hyperparameter. It's a number that I pick in advance. And this number is going to be very critical. Uh, and I'm going to go into great detail, detail about this number too in the next few slides. Before I go on, are there any questions about this? Okay, so I've written the last function in two completely equivalent ways. An overall renormalization, an overall rescaling of the last function doesn't affect um, you know, what the minimum of the trained neural network is. Um, but so I've just moved the beta from this time to this time, but it's going to highlight two, diff two different um, um, parts of the relevance of beta. But first of all, I want to point out that beta is dimensionful. If it has whatever units the reconstruction loss has. So I told you for jets, I'm going to use earth movers distance for the reconstruction loss. And that has units of GEV. Um, and so beta is a dimensionful quantity uh, because this term here is, is dimensionless. Okay. Um, secondly, to go into more, uh, so I'm going to focus on this form of the equation where the beta is in front of the KL divergence to illustrate more um, the concept that this is an information cost. So in the limit the beta goes to infinity, the last function doesn't care about this term, it's going to focus on this term. And I told you that this term is minimized when all the mu's are zero, all the sigmas are one, um, uh, which means that every input is mapped to a standard Gaussian. So these two blue curves are the the encoded distributions for two different inputs, and they're very strongly overlapping Gaussians. So you've given a sample from one and a sample from the other, you can't determine which one it came from. Um, so no information is encoded in the latent space in the limit that beta goes to infinity. In the limit that beta is very small, where small, it's going to be determined by the length scales in the problem, um, given that beta is dimensionful. Um, 
then it's going to um, focus on the reconstruction error. Uh, there's less of an information cost. And so different imports are going to be mapped to different non-overlapping narrow Gaussians that have different, different means, and all of them have small variances. Um, and so now the decoder can tell that a point drawn from this distribution is very different from a point drawn from this distribution, right? So maybe, you know, a green apple looks like this and a red apple looks like this and so on. And it knows the difference between green and red apples. Okay. So beta is the, is the going rate, is the cost for encoding information. The encoder is only going to inf encode information about the input to the extent that its usefulness for reconstruction is sufficient to justify the costs. The, going, the conversion rate um, is this number beta. Finally, if I rewrite it in this form with beta underneath the reconstruction loss, um, uh, one gets the intuition that beta can be regarded as a resolution in the reconstruction space, a resolution on what kind of reconstruction errors we're interested in. And so um, uh, the point is given an import from here, the stochasticity present in the latent space sampling is going to um, smear the reconstruction on the output at a scale that's determined by this size beta. Okay, so now let's look at a concrete toy example that for me at least gave me all of my intuition of what's, what's going on here. So now I have uh, uh, a slightly different toy example. It's the simplest non-trivial toy example I could think of. It's 2D points drawn from, a, um, uh, from this banana shaped distribution. The way I generated this was I started with the normal distributions and the x-axis and the y-axis where the x-axis has standard deviation one, y has standard deviation of point one, and then I just deforms the oval into a banana with some quadratic displacement. Um, and um, I have a, a variational order encoder that has an encoder, the details don't matter, and a decoder. And the latent space, I've given it 10 dimensions, uh, which uh, is clearly overkill because there's only two dimensions in the input and output. But we'll see there's a pedagogical reason for, for this. I want to try and uh, see if I can extract from the autoencoder what's the dimensionality of this data rather than telling it. OK. So after I've trained this variational autoencoder, um, uh, to reconstruct the uh, reconstruct these points with the reconstruction error being the Euclidean distance. Um, uh, I'm going to show you what the uh, has been learned in the latent space of the autoencoder. Now, in the left plot, I've chosen two specific directions in the latent space, and I'm going to sh show you shortly how I chose those two two dimensions. But for now, this is just it's just some two, di two directions in the 10-dimensional latent space that I've chosen. And the um, gray data points are um, um, the latent space encodings of the, the banana-shaped data set that I showed you before. And they form some kind of uh, something very close to a 2D Gaussian in the latent space. And I also have these colored uh, grid lines, which are just vertical and horizontal lines. And then next to it um, is the reconstruction space. So what I've done is I've taken the decoder and the gray points in the reconstruction space are the decoded versions of all the gray points in the latent space. So they reconstruct again this banana shape. And then the grid lines in the reconstruction space are the decoded versions of the grid lines in the latent space. So these horizontal and vertical latent space lines are mapped to the length and girth of the banana. So the variational autoencoder seems to have learned the geometry of the banana. It's, it's learned to orthogonalize um, 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 and organize the directions of the banana in these specific directions. Um, now, I want to probe in more detail the statistics of the latent space encodings. So um, we call that for each latent space dimension, each event is given a mean and a variance. So each event has 10 means and 10 variances. So in this top right plot here, there's 10 data points, one for each latent space dimension. And um, eight of them are down here, and then two are here and here. And um, for each point, the y-axis is um, 
the root mean square of all the uh, means um, for all the encoded data points. Um, and the x-axis is the, um, I, think I've been, I think it's the mean of the inverse variances rather than the inverse of the mean variant or standard deviation. Either way, it's not too important. Um, uh, so, you know, for these eight dimensions, uh, all data points are being encoded with, um, uh, with zero mean and variance of one. Um, whereas um, for this latent space dimension, um, there's, a uh, there's a spread, there's a variance of one in the encoded means and the variance is, um, the events are being encoded with, encoded with small variance. Um, and for this point here, we're, um, even smaller variance. And so the, the distributions um, associated with each individual event are very narrow for these points, whereas for these eight directions, they're all very wide. And so this shows you how I picked these two latent space directions. I just picked, I just sorted, um, uh, say by, by this quantity here and picked the top two. And those are the two that the variational auto encoder is telling me it's learned information in. In these other eight, it's, it's just not learning any information in. So the variational auto encoder has realized that um, only two pieces of information are needed to encode the structure of the banana. The auto encoder, the regular auto encoder would have used all, all 10 dimensions because uh, it's, it's, it's dumb. It, there's, no, there's no reason not to. Whereas the variational auto encoder, there's a cost for every you know, extra piece of information it's using. Um, so in that plot, it's only summary statistics. Um, in the bottom right plot, um, we have distributions. So there's 10 histograms in this plot corresponding to the 10 latent space directions. Each one is a different color and eight of them are piled up here. Um, well, uh, um, so each, so there's maybe 10,000 events going into this and each event is one entry in, the hist in each, each of these 10 histograms. Um, and so in these two dimensions, you know, the very narrow distributions are for the events um, at this place and this place, and all the other eight are piled up here. Um, and you know, one can do a bit of a spectroscopy here. There's a factor of 10 between the resolution um, and, and this histogram compared to this histogram. So this one here corresponds to the length of the banana, and this one here corresponds to the girth of the banana. And uh, you know, in order to have an isotropic error in the reconstruction space, the fractional error along the length is much more important than the fractional error along the girth. And so the length, the fractional, the fractional position should be 10 times greater than along the girth in order to have an isotropic uncertainty um, uh, um, on the actual position. And so you can literally take, so I, I, I I should have said at the start, I've been training this VA with beta less than 0.1, which is the smaller scale of the banana. I think it was 0.03. And if you literally take 0.03 divided by, by these numbers, you get something like one and 0.1, which is a length and width of the banana. So you can actually infer, you know, even if I've never seen this banana before, by looking at the, the, the statistics of the latent space of the variational auto encoder that's been trained in the banana, I could infer what one of these what are these uh, dimensions? I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, principal component analysis, but it's, it's you know, literally you'd, um, um, uh, um, how do I say this? I, I, I don't need to go into that, but um, well, what it's doing is it's finding the major and minor axes of the, the banana and identifying them and showing you what are um, their shapes and sizes. Now what happens if I, instead of having a very small beta, I have a medium beta. So this time beta is 0.3. And I train the variational autoencoder all over again. This time it's only learning information in one direction. Um, and if I probe, you know, what it's learned in that direction, it's learned the length of the banana. That's because, you know, um, th this circle here kind of illustrates the resolution that it's, it's, it's learning at. Um, it's the width of the banana is beneath the resolution that it's interested in. So um, uh, learning the position along the girth of the banana is, doesn't justify the cost associated with the speeder. So it chooses to forget about 
uh, this narrow dimension and it only learns this long dimension. Um, and then finally, when I train with large beta, I think this is beta equals three, um, neither the length or the width are um, uh, within the resolution of interest. And so all points are mapped to just the average point at the center and no information is learned by the variational autoencoder because nothing is worth learning uh, given the cost of encoding information. Um, I wanted to find, so we can see that there's some notion of dimensionality here, right? There's, uh, um, uh, there's two dimensions um, when you probe it at small resolutions, one when you probe it at intermediate resolutions, and zero when you probe it at uh, broad resolutions. And I wanted to find some ways of quantifying this. I haven't actually seen this discussed in the literature, although I certainly, well, definitely not in particle physics literature. I'm not too familiar with machine learning literature. I've never seen it done, but I, um, I've been trying to find some formulae myself, and I came up with, um, well, I originally guessed by basically looking at the toy example you just saw, a formula that was very close to this. Uh, here, KL is the second time of the last function, the KL divergence. Actually, I should give a bit more clarification this, for these formulae. So what I do is I train at several different values of beta. Um, I train it uh, like a fine grid in beta. And so I have uh, you know, dozens of trained neural networks. And each trained neural network will have you know, found uh, averaged over the data set, some average reconstruction errors, some average KL diversions uh, on the reconstructed data. And if I look at how, how um, these quantities vary with beta, the KL diversions, how that varies with log of beta, and how the reconstruction error varies with beta squared, um, uh, uh, I claim that these two formulae give uh, quantities that I call dimensionality that um, that um, that are close to like intuitive pictures of dimensionality. Uh, and I've plotted here um, on the right. Um, so the dash curve is the correlation dimension, which has nothing to do with the autoencoder uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, the blue and the orange curves are these two quantities that I've defined. Uh, and you see it gives, you know, it's, it's not the same as correlation dimension because it changes more sharply, but it gives you exactly what you expect, that the dimensionality um, is zero at large scales, one at intermediate scales, two at small scales. Um, uh, I, I, um, I'm still trying to, I'm not going to go into detail about the derivations of these because I don't, I, I really don't have time. And also I don't have um, strong analytic understanding of this. I have hand wavy and analytic understanding. I have been playing around with looking at the last functions and making some simplifying assumptions and writing derivatives, setting them to zero and um, and things like that. Um, but I think there's a lot of implicit assumptions in, in, in what I've done that I want to probe. Um, uh, but um, yeah, you know, there's some in, a little bit of intuition behind these two formulas. So the top one is something like um, if you have a d-dimensional Gaussian, the variance um, on the samples is um, uh, on the you know, radius of the samples uh, scales with the dimensionality of the the, the Gaussian. Um, and so, if you take the derivative of this quantity with respect to uh, the resolution scale squared, you get d out. And so, I, I think of this reconstruction error is something like this r squared and this this beta is something like sigma um and i have a reason for this factor of two but i, I won't be able to go into it um whereas this is a variation of of how much information is being encoded this kl divergence really is it quantifies information i know in information theory they, they have units for this like it's measured in nats or something i don't fully understand it but um yeah this is some measure of how of how much information, uh, how the information being encoded, how that quantity is scaling with the resolution scale that you're interested in, which is a measure of information complexity, um, uh, which is what dimensionality is all about. Okay, um, so that's a work in progress. Um, and yeah, so, uh, these, these things that I've shown you, as far as I can tell than you, um, I've been asking around people who, I'm more familiar with the field than me. No one else has seen these things before, so maybe they really are to you. Um, I don't know. Um, 
uh, I'm, I'm, unless he wants to time. Um, I got, yeah, okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly give an intuition for why, um, uh, you know, I showed you that the information that the variational autoencoder has learned is orthogonalized, right? The, um, it's learned two orthogonal directions in the banana space. And it's also organized, like it's encoding the, the length with um, greater fractional position than the girth. And it's, it's intuitive to understand, um, at least in simple cases like this. Um, the orthogonalization is because, and suppose you didn't orthogonalize. So if you wanted to encode a position on a plane according to its positions along these two non-orthogonal axes, the extra, the second axis doesn't give you much additional information compared to the first axis because there's still this snadly flat direction. Um, it's, it's silly to, you know, uh, given a point to encode its position with a 1% precision on this axis and a 1% precision on that axis, because you still have a large, you know, 10, 20, 30% uncertainty in this direction. Whereas if you do 1% precision, 1 precision along this axis and 1% precision along this axis, the absolute position is known to 1% you know, precision. Um, and similarly with organization, like it's silly to, you know, encode, um, if you have a long axis and a narrow axis, um, it's silly to encode along the long axis with 10% and the narrow axis with 10% if your distance measure is isotropic in the two directions. Um, uh, what you really want is higher position in the longer axis and smaller position in the narrower axis so that your, 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 actual, your absolute error is, is, is isotropic. And so that's why it encodes you know, um, uh, directions of higher variance um, with higher precision than um, directions of smaller variance. Uh, any questions before I move on to uh, um, jets? Okay. So, um, so okay. Now I sorry. I just sorry, to... I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, you give the two definitions saying that your capture is the cold dimension. So, uh, so uh, I'm just curious, what's the motivation to 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 invent a new variable, and the, what's the advantage compared to this cold dimension they defined? I don't. The motivation. So there's no definite ad ad advantage. I'm so, so this is ex exploratory. I, I I really don't know if this is actually going to lead to like interesting new results for physics of uh, of uh, data science and machine learning uh, so i don't have uh, well okay I, I i can give you some advantages but these advantages are like the the reason that i'm doing this so um um so w one problem with say the correlation dimension is that um you have a cursive dimensionality so you're, you're counting you're counting number of points within spheres and um, um, uh, if you the the ha, if you have like a hundred dimensional space, then if, even if you have like millions of points, the, the the points become sparser and sparser as you increase the dimensionality of the space. And so the correlation dimension breaks down pretty quickly in terms of actually being able to calculate it. Um, high dimensions. Um, whereas I, I have some toy examples where I can show that um, training a variational autoencoder and probing its dimensionality is, is um, it, it, uh, at, at some point it will still have a, a, a sparsity problem, but uh, it's not nearly as sensitive to it as the brute force calculation. Um, and um, uh, I have an intuition for that, but I, I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, um, I think it's okay. It's okay. I think we can continue. Uh, we can continue. We can discuss later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, when I'm when I've been pursuing this, I, I I I've been mostly interested in just think like thinking of all the wet, trying to find out how much stuff I can extract from the statistics, from, from the stuff that's been learned in the latent space of the variational autoencoder. Uh, and uh, without at this point being too concerned about 
whether it's better than other things. We've got um, uh, uh, and um, yeah, so that's, that's been my philosophy on this. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, you know, play, play around with top jets for a bit. Um, so, okay. Um, so I, I have a sample of simulated top jets um, uh, that's been run through Badgraph and um, Pythia. And um, uh, I forgot whether it has a Delphi simulation or not, but it's not super important. Um, so the imports is top jets, which consist of between one and a hundred particles. In fact, that jets that had more than a hundred particles, they were just, you know, the particles are sorted by PT and the softest ones are cut out, but that only affects a tiny fraction of events. And then um, it goes into this neural network. Um, the details aren't important. This PFN is the encoder. It's an encoder. It's just a kind of encoder whose structure is such that it's invariant to permutations between particle labels. Um, and then it goes into a large latent space. Um, large, it was something like 200 or so. Uh, in particular, it's just more than I imagined that I'll need. And then I want to kind of infer, you know, um, the, the true dimensionality uh, by some meaning of the, um, of the data set. And then the decoder is some dense network, which decodes to 50 particles, just uh, with different uh, you know, the PTs and their angular coordinates. And the reconstruction error is uh, this, what was called the sinkhorn distance, which is an approximation to earth movers distance that's um, a lot easier to, um, uh, to implement um, uh, practically and, and to find its derivative, um, which is important in training this. But in some limit of, there's a couple of hyperparameters of this that in some limit, um, this quantity becomes exactly the same as that quantity. Um, so, um, okay, so I've trained uh, this variational order encoder with beta of 40 GeV, um, uh, which is below the, the um, mass of the top quark, so it should be learning the, the hard substructure of the top. And here again, we have these histograms associated with the various um, latent space directions of the trained order encoder. Um, and there's two, two directions up here and then a bunch down here. Um, so first of all, I want to investigate what did these two mean? And those, those correspond to an energy scale of um, a TeV or so. And um, in order to investigate that, I can literally, um, I can take a, a jet from my sample, I can look at its latent code, and then I can translate that code just to log, say, the orange direction or the blue direction um, and uh, decode um, different jets on those translations. And you see going along the blue direction, translating along the blue direction corresponds exactly to translating along the phi direction of the detector. Translating along the orange direction corresponds exactly to translating along the eta direction of the detector. So uh, the variational autoencoder has learned that, um, that uh, you know, it's, been, it's learned the cylindrical geometry of the, the detector effectively. Um, and it's learned to orthogonalize that these, that phi and eta are topologically like different directions. Um, and also you see that the jets, the substructure doesn't change as you translate. So it's learned that it's learned to separate the position of the jet from the substructure of the jet. Now what a, I, I think you can all guess what these dimensions are going to correspond to. It's going to correspond to variations in the, the substructure of the jet. And you know, let's do accounting. There's one, two, three, four, five, six directions here, which, um, uh, it seems reasonable for you know the number of internal angles in the top jet. So let's probe two of them, the two most important ones. Uh, by most important, I mean the ones which are furthest to the right um, on this plot, the green and the red directions. And this time, what I've done is, um, so I'm, I'm moving around in this two-dimensional plane defined by these two directions, and at each point in the plane, I'm decoding a jet. So the one in the center is uh, is a jet corresponding to somewhere in the middle of that plane. And then I can um, move in these two directions in this latent space plane and decode different jets. And we see that um, in this two dimensional plane, the, um, going out along some radial line corresponds to some stretching of the jet. And the angle of that stretching is determined by the angle in this plane. Um, so these two directions are describing um, some 
kind of a like strategy moment of the jet. Um, this pink one I found interesting. Um, so these are jets that are generated from translations along that pink direction. Um, and this is some kind of like S wave deformation of the jet. On the right, it's very, the jet's very concentrated in the center. On the left, it's, it forms a, a ring. Okay. Um, I can, you can train the, the variational order encoder at different values of beta. So here I've trained it at 400 GeV, which is above the top mass. And so it's going to smear over the internal substructure of the jet. And as you see now, it's only learning the position of the jet and it doesn't, it just gives an average substructure. Um, okay. And then I can ask, you know, what's the dimensionality of these top jets according to the formulae that I defined earlier. I can compare to what the MIT group got with their correlation dimension. The, there's this little difference, which is they, um, so I trained on, um, uh, um, uh, I didn't center the jets. I allowed them to, to be at any, Eder and phi coordinate in the detector, and I didn't, you know, rotate the jets. Um, so uh, they did center and rotate, which removes some dimensions. Um, so, for instance, I had a dimensionality of two, which corresponded to translations, which they modded out um, here. But you see, when you get to the top mass scale, this goes up to around a dimensionality of nine, um, which is three more, uh, eight or nine, which is two or three more than they get, which is what I expect based on the preprocessing, and then. I want to probe, you know, what happens as I train at smaller and smaller um, scales. Um, do I learn about, you know, the um, uh, the, the splitting function like 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 they did? Um, but yeah, this is uh, uh, it becomes technically more and more challenging to to train, and so I just need to um, put more work into that. Okay, so this kind of gets to the point that you asked. Um, uh, uh, um, is, is, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there's not, there's not a concrete answer, um, yet. Um, yeah, uh, uh, um, this geometric picture, um, of collider events, it's a diff it's a new way of looking at the data. It's not yet clear to me whether we'll get new insights. Um, I asked uh, at the machine learning for jets conference, these two anonymous professors, um, uh, there's a very optimistic one who, who uh, has the point of view that once you've understood the geometry of the data manifold, you've really understood everything about the problem. And you know, the, the machine learning approaches that I've been describing is, is just a, is a, 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 a way of probing that geometry. Um, the pessimistic anonymous professor uh, isn't, isn't really convinced. Um, uh, I'm kind of out of time, but um, I, uh, so there is an application which is the dessert. Um, do I have time to, to go through the dessert? There's always time for dessert. Perfect. Okay. So, um, uh, everything that I've described, um, I've been working with pure samples, right? I, I, for, in the physics case, I trained on pure top jets. But what if I have a mix of top jets, W jets, QCD jets? Uh, it becomes a lot more complicated. What, what does dimensionality mean? Um, will my strategies even work in that case? Um, uh, um, what if you're trying to uh, study new physics, for instance? And I was going to make some, with some backgrounds. So here's a, I don't have any um, concrete physics study of that yet, but I have a toy example, um, uh, which is, um, so I have two, two data sets on top of each other, this narrow banana and this broad Gaussian. And they both have equal number of events in them. And so they're clearly drawn from two different distributions. Um, this, you know, n-dimensional Gaussian latent space representation isn't necessarily like the best representation for this. Um, uh, but like one might has, have an intuition that, you know, since there's two categories of events, ones that live in the banana, ones that live in this bulk, and they have different dimensionalities associated with those manifolds. Um, uh, um, I wanted to study what happens if you actually have um, a categorical latent space. So in, in addition to the, to the Gaussian latent space, you also have something that encodes, you know, whether 
events are belonging to one category or another. And just like with the Gaussian, there's um, the the VA is encode is encouraged to learn as little as possible here. Uh, only learn something here if it turns out to be useful for um, for representing the data. And so I trained on this data set that um, it knows nothing in advance about there being two categories. In fact, I did learn for there to be up to four categories. Um, but at the end, it only actually used um, uh, two of the categories. The others ended up just being random. Um, and the two categories that it learned was this banana shape and blue and all the points in gray. So those are the two categories that it learned. And then you can ask for the, each of the two categories, what does the mapping to the continuous latent space look like? Now for these banana points in blue, um, they're all mapped to a one-dimensional manifold. And if I ask, you know, if I use my formula to ask what's the dimensionality of the space, I'd get one. But these other points that are um, assigned to category two, they're mapped to a two-dimensional manifold. And so this VAE has actually learned that the data um, is best described as two sets of data, one of which lives on a one-dimensional manifold, one lives on a two-dimensional manifold. Now it remains to be seen whether this is actually, yeah, this was a very easy example. Is it actually going to do the same thing if you train on a, a realistic mixed sample of LHC events? Uh, I'm not sure, but you know, the, the, the hope and the idea is that um, you know, W jets and top jets, the, the manifolds have different structures, different dimensionalities. So if you trained on a mixture of them, I, I, uh, I, I would imagine it would learn um, uh, to represent them in different, different spaces. And in order to do that, it'll have to learn a classifier of what's a W jet and what's a top jet. The dream would be if you could use this for, you know, unsupervised new physics search. Um, uh, I, I, and that's something I want to explore in the, um, in the, um, uh, maybe in a couple of months from now. Um, it's not clear to me whether in practice it's going to work, but if it does work, I think it's really, in a sense, it's really beautiful because what, uh, in a philosophical sense, because what this is doing is it's, it's, yeah, it's doing the same thing we do. Like there, well, at least one way of representing the reason of why we talk about, you know, this class of events and that class of events is just because that's the most parsimonious way of describing the physics um, uh, to, to think, of, think of it in terms of these categories of, of, of top events, diverse on events, etc. cetera. Um, also because that connects with the, the physics, but the fact that there's these categories is also coming from, from the physics. So that, the, the variational autoencoder is learning to categorize events just because that's the most information efficient way of describing the data set in this case. Um, I, I, don't know, I see some kind of beauty to that. Um, I don't know if that's worth anything, but uh, uh, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so um, yeah, the point of all this, um, um, it's learning the geometry of, of, of the data set. Um, Determined, of course, by the distance metric you give it in the first place. And there's an open question about there are other interesting distance metrics. So you're going to learn different things from different distance metrics, if you're going to learn anything from any of them. Um, but um, uh, yeah, and the variational autoencoder learns to disentangle parts of the, you know, um, uh, uh, disentangle directions in the data space that are associated with hierarchically different distance scales um, that so long as the distance metric is physical, uh, has some physical meaning, then those hierarchies are also going to correspond to some, some physical hierarchies too. Um, and there's this dimensionality, which um, has some relationship with the dimensionality of the true data manifold. Um, I'm trying to make that more concrete and analytical. And this is, everything's coming from the demand that the variational autoencoder is finding a representation of the data that's as parsimonious as possible in an information theoretic sense. Um, and finally, special thanks to these faces who I've had um, uh, very useful discussions with, particularly Matt Schwartz, who suggested a lot of the toy examples in last summer that gave me most of my intuition. Um, Patrick and Eric and the MIT group, who I've discussed a lot about Earth Movers Distance with, and, Ben Nackman, who's also been helpful.
Thank you. Okay, more questions? Could you go back to the top jets? Yeah. I guess this one. Uh, yeah, that one. So if, if you worked at a smaller beta, would you be able to split those different distributions apart more or is that? No, works? no. So these, these will all be piled up because there's no, um, when the top quark decays into three quarks, like there's not a hierarchy of, of scales, like everything's really happening at the same time, that there's not much separation between the W mass and the top mass. And so there, there's no, um, intrinsically there's no separation. There's not, well, there's, you know, there's lots of I, ways. I guess it's a question about different metrics. Could you invent um, a metric that splits those apart? I, I I doubt it. Like the question is, um, like is there? I guess mean, it's a question of like the uniqueness of some. Uh, yeah, so suppose you've chosen some some scheme for for defining the relative angles between the quarks and the top jet. Like, does is there, in any sense, um, you know, some preferred schemes? So let me let me let me um, uh, put this a slightly different way. If I chose some BSM example, maybe um, or maybe I just change the top quark mass um, to to four hundred GeV and that PT. Let me say it's a TeV, but I keep the W mass of eighty eighty G, um, eighty GeV. Um, then in that case, there is a hierarchy between you know the top to W quark and then the W to quark quark, and I'd I'd be able to. Um, the, um, yeah, I'd be able to see those hierarchies here. I'd have, I'd have, um, I'd have um, a couple of histograms corresponding to the top to bottom W decay, and then at a different scale, I'd have the W to quark quark. I'd have um, a couple of histograms there. Um, so if you can find, yeah, if you can find some metric where that really does is able to separate those those physical processes in a real way, then yeah, you'd be able to have these histograms not on top of each other. Okay. Could could you go to the dimensionality of the top jet plot? Yeah. So does it make sense to say that there's a a optimal value of beta where the if there's a plateau as we go to the left then you no. take the biggest value of beta that's at the edge of the plateau that's somehow optimal Op optimal for for one i don't um like if you're interested in in the qtd splitting within the top jet then you are, you can only investigate that by sending beta lower um, if you're only interested, yeah, if you're interested only in the hard decay of the top quark, then uh, kind of the most minimal description of that physics uh, is learned by the VAE trained with a beta of, you know, around 100 GV. Yeah, I don't, I, I thought you did 40 before I yeah uh, so there's there's some okay there's some um there's some uh um there's some technicality that i wanted to avoid which is um uh that actually caused me a lot of confusion a couple of months ago which is um all uh, right so here like in in the, in a key dimensional gash in the um the the variance in the radiance is, and, and the radial direction is d times the variance in any particular direction. Um, and so, um, and the, um, yeah, the beta, this beta is actually, actually on this side of the equation. So it's this, um, uh, this beta corresponds to the sigma, 
the beat div is like so okay the, the top has say seven dimensions to it or something um, and um, so you you can think of mapping that to some seven dimensional gaussian and um, uh, in um, the the fact that the top mass is 170 GeV um, is related to like this R squared being 170 GeV. Um, uh, which you have to scale by the dimensionality to get, uh, um, I'm having trouble putting this into words, but yeah, well, um, uh, there's a, let, let me put it this way, there's a factor of square root of D, where D is the dimensionality to get between say this 40 GeV and the, you know, uh, the top mass scale. Okay. Can you go back to the banana dimensionality plot you were just on? Yeah. That one. So for this one, I mean, once you take beta less than 0.1, you're on that top plateau. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all the information. Yeah. So that's somehow that seems like an optimal value of beta. Right, but maybe maybe I didn't know. For instance, you know, maybe this was um I already knew in advance this is a two dimensional space, so it can't the number can't be greater than two. But maybe this banana was embedded in a hundred dimensional space in some complicated sure, but way. That, that's what your analysis would tell you. I mean, there would be a highest plateau and then <clears throat> when you're at the edge of that plateau, that's the most information you can get. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wouldn't use the I wouldn't use the phrasing like this is the optimal value of beta. I'd say right there at, the, at this value of well, um, I, I'd say that yeah. There's no once I um, sent beta below that value, then there's nothing more. Um, uh, there's no more information to be learned. But it's not quite that. that um, it, yeah, the difference between, say, stopping just as, as, I, as I've entered the plateau versus going further and further along the plateau. The difference is, as I go further and further along the plateau, the variational order encoder is still learning to encode each dimension with greater and greater precision. That's proportional to, to beta, right? And so if I, if I um, reduce beta by a factor of two on that plateau, then every direction is going to be recorded with a precision that's um, a factor of too greater, and so if I'm if I for instance if I'm using this for some for some task where I care about the position of the reconstruction, then um, you know the, the, um, uh, then there isn't necessarily some optimal point. I might want to go as far as possible. Well, then you just wouldn't do any auto. You wouldn't use an auto auto encoder if you wanted to do that. You would just take the raw data. Well, so one one um one pos possible application of the variational auto encoder in general that I've discussed with um, Ben Nachman. We're thinking of writing a paper, but it doesn't really relate to all this analytical study. It's something like um, uh, for doing like fast like trigger level kinds of analysis, like um. Maybe you want uh, so a variational autoencoder. Um, one of its applications in the real world is compression, um, image compression, and video compression. What mm -hmm. it is, it's uh, it's a domain-specific, highly efficient compression algorithm. Um, so if you train it on cat pictures, and if you train it on a good enough, broad enough sample of cat pictures, it can be very good at very efficiently compressing cats. Um, but that that would be. So the best compression is where you've got all the dimensionality with the lowest resolution. Exactly. So that would well, be well, the optimal beta. Well, no. So I mean, there's a trade-off, right? There's a compression with trade-off. Like you can, yeah, you can get better and better reconstruct. You know, you want to compress so that you can reconstruct it at the end of the day, right? And you can compress it more and more, encoding less and less data. But then your reconstruction will be more and more lossy. And so there's a trade-off. There's no single optimal point. And so the idea for um, 
uh, the LHC would be, uh, well, just to finish off the point that I was making before, like if you then pot a DUG into the, the, the VAE, then it's going to reconstruct the DUG as a very weird cat. So it's, it's not, uh, it's, highly, it's a highly specialized compression algorithm for the kinds of things that it's trained on. And a possible application would be to you know, train it on LHC data and use it as like an alternative, um, like trigger, trigger level analysis pathway where you can have um, high throughputs of um, highly compressed LHC data. Um, and then the question would be like, you want, you want the fidelity to be as good as possible, but you also want the compression to be as good as possible. High fidelity um, would mean you want um, beta to be smaller. High compression means you want beta to be larger. And so there, would, there would be an optimal value then? Oh, well, it depends. Uh, or, no, because it, it, well, once you've, once you've defined your, your requirements that you can find an optimal value, but different requirements would lead to different optimal values. Like maybe if you decide, like one might have in mind what some kind, uh, but actually part of the reason we haven't proceeded with this yet is because it's been difficult to find a good physics case for it. But I mean, suppose you have some idea of, um, of some kinds of new physics that you imagine something like this might be able to find that other kinds of approaches wouldn't be able to find. Uh, then um, you, you, based on your assumptions about what kind of thing you might be looking for, you have some fidelity requirement. Alternatively, if you're interested in some rates, some cross section that you want to probe, you have some throughput requirements. Um, and so you have different, different optimal points depending on what kinds of cross section you have in mind searching for or what kind of fidelity you feel that you need to compress at. Yeah, I'm only gonna ask one more question, promise. Okay. So <laughs> say you train this on every type of standard model jet, and then you fed it some new physics. If the new physics was sufficiently different, then wouldn't it just, if I chose my optimal beta, then it would reconstruct poorly. Yeah, right. it would reconstruct the closest kind of standard model jet that it, it was trained on. But then you could compare the compressed version with the original version and yeah. see that it's a much larger than average. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly, um, you know, there were two groups, David Shee's group and um, Tillman Plains group that on the same day, um, uh, one and a half years ago, they proposed um, um, the, using a standard order encoder, doing exactly that for anomaly detection. And of course, one application of the variational order encoder would just be to do the same thing again. Maybe it performs better, maybe it performs worse. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm not really excited about doing that study myself. Maybe an um, uh, uh, undergrad or a young uh, grad student who's interested in machine learning might want to do that exercise. Um, but I've got other things I'd rather um, think about. Okay, anyone else uh, have a question? Okay, let's thank Jack again. Thank you for having me again.